Hello, Every Nation family. Thank you so much for joining us. We're in week two of our series in case of emergency. So buckle up, listen up, and take notes. up family welcome to week three of our sermon series it's called in case of emergency so i take it you are probably watching this in case of an emergency and so you're here for the right reasons if that is the case so today this sermon is called if only the idea is if only i knew if only i knew before we dive into it let me pray for us Jesus, you are king of our hearts, you are king of our lives, and we want to worship you, Lord. And so we want to worship you with our hearts, we want to worship you with our minds, we want to worship you with our knowledge. And so, Lord, in case of emergency is why we're here. And so, Lord, we pray, come and open our hearts, open our minds to what you want to say, what you want to do today. And if our question is, or if our statement is, if only, if only we knew, may we know by the time this video ends. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, I'm going to dive right into it. In the Gospel of Luke, Luke recounts at the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, um, Jesus states the following, right? Luke 6 verse 46, he states this. And this is probably the scariest scripture in the whole of scripture. This is probably the scariest sentence in the whole of scripture. But Jesus says this, he says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I tell you? Right? And so there's a parallel of this scripture in Luke and Matthew, Matthew 7, 21. This is the elaborate part of it, like the, the longer part of it. It says, not everyone he's, who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Jesus says these words, and and for me personally, and I think loads of other people out there, this is probably the scariest piece of, of scripture that there is. The scariest words that came out of Jesus' mouth is him saying that some people will stand before him and say, Lord, Lord, and he will say, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. People will say, we did these things. And Jesus will say, depart from me. Jesus Jesus says that many will come to him on judgment day and call him savior. They will say that we accepted you as our savior, but they will call him Lord, Lord, but he will tell them to turn away from him. And so the first thing that kind of sticks out in this, in this scripture is why does, why does he say they'll call him Lord, Lord? Why twice? Why twice, Lord, Lord? Well, if you look through scriptures, there are multiple times where this happens, where people are addressed twice. Same name, twice. An example is in Exodus when God calls Moses the burning bush, out of the burning bush. He says, when the Lord saw that Moses was coming closer, he called him from the middle of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. Another example is when God calls Abraham, Genesis 22, 11. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And then another example is where on the road to Damascus, Saul is met by Christ himself. Christ calls him, it says, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, there's a reason why Jesus said people will call me Lord, Lord. It's because the people who are talking to him, just like in the examples mentioned, when God talks to Moses, it's from an intimate space, someone who already knew Moses. Someone who knew about him, someone who knew him intimately was calling him. The same habit happened to Abraham. The same happened to Saul. Someone who already knew him intimately called onto him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? All of these texts in one is one where the person addressing, addressing is not just calling the individual, but the call is from an intimate, personal relationship. Jesus says, people will come to me and they will call me Lord, Lord. Jesus, you are my savior. We did many mighty things in your, in your name. We did all of these things. And then Jesus will reply, 
Oh, so you were a tither. Oh, you were a missionary, right? Oh, you were a pastor, right? I do not know you. You call me Lord, Lord, but it is in vain. You come to me calling to me out of a personal relationship, but there was never a personal relationship. Jesus isn't talking about the outcasts. He's not talking about the people who maybe know him. He's talking about the people who think that they know him, but they do not know him. No, wait, let me rephrase that. They think they know him, but Jesus does not know them. That is where the true fruit lies. The scariest piece of scripture. The question does is not whether you know him. It is whether he knows you, whether the relationship is two way, whether there is a bond between you and Christ where he also knows you. Because Jesus later says to his disciples, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If there's a relationship here, commandments need to be kept. That is how you prove your love to me is not by just calling me Lord, Lord, not by just professing my name in public, but by actually keeping to my commandments. The test is the fruit of the obedience. It's not just the saying of the words, but it's actually the deeds that are done within. It is the actual fruit of the obedience. Because anybody can say that they love Jesus. Anybody can profess it out loud. The proof is in the pudding though. The proof is in the obedience of what actually happens in their life. So Jesus says to these people, you will call, they will call him Lord, Lord. This means they will proclaim him as their authority. He, they will admit him as their king. They will say, you are sovereign over me. And then Jesus will tell them, well, you did not do as I told you. You proclaim these things, but your fruit was never there. There was never any obedience. The proof was in the pudding and the pudding was non-existent. There was no malfa pudding. There was nothing there. The dessert wasn't there. And then he follows up his question in Luke with a brief parable, right? And so I don't know if you've ever read the Bible like this, but it's beautiful. When you go through a chapter, not just reading a phrase, but actually seeing what this chapter holds, because there's a golden thread that runs through it. And Jesus makes this statement and then the parable follows and the parable directly links up with the statement. The parable, the parable follows and it says in Luke 6, verse 47 and 49, it says, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he looks like. And then he says this, he is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundations on the rock. And when a flood arose, the streams broke against the house and he could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. Now I come from the beautiful country of Namibia. And if you don't know what, where that is, it's just north of South Africa. It borders with South Africa. And the, 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 the space in the country where I come from, the region in the country that I come from, is a very dry, arid region. It has the oldest desert in the world in it as well. And so it's really interesting because it completely relates with the, the environment of Israel. A dry, arid environment where the sand is thin and it hasn't tasted water in a really, really long time. And so a picture is going to pop up to show you exactly what I'm talking about. And there's a really famous river in Namibia. There's a really famous river that runs right past my town. And if you look at that picture, you'll see that on the one side of the river, you see the oldest desert in the world, all sand. And the river itself is also just sand. And then on the other side, you see these big, thick rocks. And so when Jesus makes this parable, this is what I'm thinking of, because he's relating the people he's talking to, to their immediate environment, which is exactly like that. He says that those who build their house on the foundation like that of the river, because the river, it seldomly flows. That river is so famous because once maybe in a decade, it'll flow. And when it flows, it flows full force because what happens is it never gets rain. Only once in maybe a decade, it rains enough that that river actually gets water in it. And the fact is that the, that sand is not used to water. So the, the, the water doesn't necessarily seep in. It just starts flowing wherever it sees fit. Wherever it can go, it will go. And that stream is strong when it comes down. And then Jesus, when he makes this parable, I see that river coming down. I see the man who heard his words, who heard the words of Jesus and built his house 
in the riverbed or on the sand next to the riverbed, he thought his house was great. But when the river comes down, he did not see it coming. He thought, well, there's plants everywhere. There's probably never any water here. And that river comes down and great is the fall of that house. But right next to it is one of the greatest pieces of rock you will find to build a house on. And people build houses on that. And you'll see that in the picture as well. And so when your house is built on the, picture, uh, on, on, on the rock, like in the picture, you'll see that the scripture says, and the river broke its banks. And so if the river would break its banks, it doesn't matter because the house is built on the rock. The house is built on the rock. And so when Jesus makes this parable, this is what I'm thinking about. This is what I'm thinking about because great was the fall of that house if it is built on the wrong, wrong platform. And so the truth is revealed when the water comes down. So when Jesus makes this parable, he is talking about when people come and stand before him, the water will come. Because when it relates to the, to the house that falls, it's not saying that the house will slowly but surely crack and you will see holes. No, it says it will fall immediately. There will be no other choice but to look at it fall. You will not be able to fix it. It will just crumble immediately is the word that is used. Jesus relates this to when people stand before him. He says, people will stand before me and they will think that they've built their house on the rock, but he, they built their house on the sand and here are the floods and they have just broken everything that you thought you built on the right foundation. But it wasn't. And so what's important in this to see is the foundation. What foundation are you building on to see the fruit? What foundation are you building on to make sure that you have a relationship with Christ? So what is the foundation of your faith? So I'm going to make, I'm probably going to tell you something that you do not know, right? Most of us think that the foundation that we build on is Jesus Christ. That is the foundation that we build. But I want to contest you with this. Yes, Jesus is the starting point. But scripture says that Jesus is the cornerstone that helps you build this house. It is what you build on. But the foundation is not just Jesus. The foundation is the apostles and the prophets. The foundation is what Christ has left behind for you and me to build knowledge, to build a relationship with him on. I've heard people say this before. I don't need X, Y, Z. All I need is Jesus. And I agree, but you need to know who he is and you need to be in a relationship with him. And the only way you can do that is by building your foundation with the true foundation that is the prophets and the apostles. And before you think, well, man, show me how you think this to be true. Ephesians 2 verse 19 to 21, it says this. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens, citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. It says Jesus, yes, he is the cornerstone. He is the beginning and the end of everything. He is the visible image of the invisible God. But he is not the foundation. He is the cornerstone. He is, he proves to us, he shows us which way to go. He shows us how to build. He is what everything hinges on, but the foundation, no, 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 no. That is the apostles and the prophets. And what does that mean? It's like, yes, bro, you're, you're talking Christianese. Well, let me show you what that means. That is this. That is this, the Bible. This is the prophets, the Old Testament, the prophets that Christ, the prophets that prophesied Christ, the prophets that showed us who our God is, the apostles that had the revelation from God who wrote everything that we need to know to build a true sustainable relationship with Christ. That is who the prophets and the apostles are. That is what Christ meant when he said that you have to build your foundation strong. The foundation of the church is the apostles and the prophets. Acts 2.42 says this, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. This is what happens just after 3,000 3, people come to Christ. The first thing they do is they devote themselves to the apostles' teachings. Why? Because they are the foundation of these people's faith. They've just come to Christ. The cornerstone is being laid. But the only way to build on this cornerstone is to build the foundation via the prophets and the apostles, devoting themselves to teachings, devo devoting yourself to Sunday teachings, devoting yourself 
to the Word of God, devoting yourself to, to reading the Word of God, devoting yourself to understanding the Word of God, devoting yourself to understanding your God better so that you might fall into a relationship with Him instead of just chasing the signs. If we don't build our foundation on the prophets, if we don't build our foundation on the apostles, what we're going to do is we're going to chase the signs. We're going to chase the wonders. We're going to do exactly what those people did that came to Christ and called him Lord, Lord. And they say, well, did we not do miracles in your name? Did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? You will follow the signs. You will follow the things. You will, f you will be led into building your house on the sand. And the only time you will, found out, you will find out that it crumbles is when the waters come and you stand before the one who deemed you not in a relationship with him. And so this, this sermon is called If Only, because if only we could go back. And I want to tell you this, go back, go back to the foundation, go back to the prophets and the apostles, go back, go back that you might not say if only when you stand before Christ. And listen to this. The revelation of John in the end of the Bible. Revelation 21 verse 9 to 14. Or everything's happened, right? And then John sees the new Jerusalem come. And it says this. Then came one of seven angels who had the seven bowls full of seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, Come, I will show you the bride the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall and 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels. And on the gates, the names of 12 tribes of the, son of, uh, the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three, ga three gates. And on the west, three, ga three gates. And listen to this. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations. And on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The 12 foundations. The 12 apostles. The prophets and the apostles. They are the foundation that we build on because when we stand before Christ may we not just have been hearers of the word but may we have been doers of the word may we not be the ones who call him Lord Lord you are sovereign you are king but we never built on a foundation the strongest foundation with the cornerstone being the beginning and the end the foundation being his apostles and his prophets that have written down everything that we need to know that we might have a relationship with him if we are to build our house on the rock, we are to be listening and teaching the word of the prophets and the apostles of Christ. So I'm, I aim to end this sermon with a question. I want you to end this sermon for yourself. Answer this question for yourself. What am I building on? Knowing that Jesus is the cornerstone, what am I building on? Where does my foundation lie? More importantly, what am I building on? this foundation on what fruit do you bear where are you going what does it look like question is this what foundation are you building on because if your foundation is the is in the sand may you never stand before christ and go if only i knew but if your foundation is on the rock may you go thank you jesus and may he never go Turn away from me, you workers of lawlessness. Might you answer this question for yourself? What am I building on? Wow, what a word. Thank you so much, Pastor Lawrence. Praise God. We want to take this moment, family, and just thank you for your generosities because of your giving that we're able to do what we do here, and that's bringing supernatural transformation to our world one person at a time. And if you've been watching this or sharing this, then you've been a part of it. And we want to thank you and also encourage you to continue giving because it allows us to share this with the world. And believe me, we're seeing firsthand the impact that online ministry is having on lives in our local context and in places we couldn't even dream of. So thank you. And we want to encourage you to keep moving as God is moving. Also, like we said, if you're sharing this, you're doing something amazing for people 
and you can't even begin to imagine how great that is. So continue to share this with a friend, share this with anyone on your contact list. You don't know the impact you're having on their lives. And listen, stay in the loop with what we're doing. We're available on almost all the social media platforms. It's on the screen right now. Get in, like, follow, subscribe on all the Every Nation Faith City social media platforms to stay in the loop with what we're doing. We don't want you to miss out on a single thing. And if you just want to get in contact with us, you want to get to share your story or hear a bit of ours, or you want to reach out for prayer, listen, we're here for you and we're excited to hear from you. Until next time, be blessed. We love you. Goodbye.